This is the Open University. You know, I may not know much about ethnology, ethnography, anthropology, spectral ontology, pseudo-psychogeography, subjective spatial mapping, human resource management, people's instinctive travels and the paths of rhythm, self-induced culture shock, invisibly expanded dwellings, invented inventories, or the architecture of the blur. But I, I thought I should make at least one last video before leaving Yangon, Myanmar, or Rangoon, Burma, if you prefer, to talk about my use of this city, which I've spent six weeks in. But first, here's the Japanese architect So Fujimoto talking to the Architectural League in 2015 in a talk entitled Between Nature and Architecture. And here he's describing an early conceptual piece he made in Shinjuku, Tokyo. The idea is to create the house melting into the city. And this is the Shinjuku area where I was living at the time. And this point, the central point, was the exact place I was living. But at that time, uh, of course, I was alone. After graduate, graduation, I didn't work for anybody, and I didn't go to any master class school or something. I just chose to be alone, to think about architecture by myself. I like to be more quiet, to be, how to say, to think about the architecture comedy. So the daily life of me is waking up in around something like noon or afternoon. And then, of course, eat a breakfast and start to think about architecture or sketching something. But of course, not so long period. So I start to walk around the city because this area is really small, tiny area, like these small pathways going through. So I just walking around bringing the sketchbooks. So sometimes I stop by at the cafe and to have a coffee and to make a sketches and then walk around again. That was the, my daily life. And then throughout my daily life, I thought if I could have one more room, even a small, then that could be just uh, nice to stay there to have a, just a table or a kitchen or a, just a bathroom, shower, something, and another room maybe for the sleeping area, something like that. So not only living in one place, but to have even small, but to have several different points to stop by, then such kind of a networks could make the living environment melting into the whole city. So this, for example, red line could be the my house, we can say or different people, the blue line is a different people's house, or something like that. So I thought we can redefine the house as an area in the city. So house is not the one object, but the network or the process of walking inside of this uh, urban fabric could be the house itself, I thought. I like the idea of an architect whose job is to make houses, dematerializing the idea of a house and sort of exploding it across a city and um, it appeals to me as a post-materialist as someone who doesn't own a house who would kind of sneakily like to own a house um, it also reminds me of something my German friend the painter Abel Auer told me when I interviewed him for Fries magazine about the Academy Isotrop which was a, a kind of art school he invented as a substitute for the Hamburg art school which he was rejected from he uh, and a group of artist friends put together this conceptual art school um, and he told me we put all our apartments together as a utopian college we made signs we put them up in real places the direction was next to my bed the refectory was just someone's kitchen the golden poodle club corridor was the gallery the lecture hall was Roberto's apartment the first semester we had an intern who designed the signs everybody's books were going to be the Isotrop library if you wanted to borrow a book from somebody they had to give it to you so my kind of daily itinerary heading out from my Chinatown hotel in Yangon has been largely oriented to a cafe 
kind of cafe, a furniture shop actually, which uh, has very good coffee, but nobody seems to know about. So I'm the only customer in there. It's just me and the two um, assistants who work there. It's a place called Pariboga. Uh, and it's two kilometers from my Chinatown hotel. So I would do this uh, walk eastwards, taking in lots of uh, the second-hand book delights of this amazing city and uh, tea shops and clothes markets, food and vegetable markets and things on the way, taking lots of snaps, uh, enjoying the event seconds. A cup of coffee is basically the price you pay to sit somewhere, to basically have um, what Fujimoto is describing as a second room somewhere else in town, a place to go to, a, a co-working space if you like. So it's a, a way to have a cheap office, uh, but I can't take that much caffeine, I can't really drink more than one cup of coffee a day without getting slightly angsty and uh, agitated. So um, I had to really be a bit careful. I think when I was in Tokyo, I was describing, giving a sort of ethnography, uh, a sort of a readout of my tools. Uh, I said that I basically just needed tatami, um, lamplight, and cheap second-hand paperbacks. But um, I have to add some things to that list. I, I brought my um, LED lamp with me in my suitcase uh, and that transforms any kind of... the depressing lighting you get in a lot of hotels can be surmounted when you simply screw together your own little light um, which which follows you around. also had my own kettle and my own little cup and uh, I've been drinking Lipton tea rather than PG Tips here because PG Tips is not sold in this country. The other thing which you can't get here is good tap water which you can simply drink out of the wall. Uh, you have to buy water so I've been a bit like a coolie. I've been dressing more and more like a local wearing longi um, uh, kind of sarong thing and a straw hat and carrying uh, big uh, sort of packs of six packs of mineral water on my shoulder. Everybody here carries things on their head or on their shoulder. Uh, so I've sort of the longer I stay here, the more I look like a native. The great thing about the streets and the, the, the natives, the residents, is that they they do look to me as if they're in fancy dress. Um, I've talked about them looking a bit new romantic. That's the only comparison point I have, because, you know, that sort of brief moment when Malcolm McLaren um, decreed that everybody should dress like a pirate. Obviously, you know, I kind of already do, but I'm used to being mocked and laughed at. Um, and I'm really refreshingly surprised when I walk out here wearing my longi uh, and a straw hat and stuff. And I think I look like I'm in fancy dress and I'm going to get uh, kind of assaulted on the street for it or mocked. And I'm not, because everybody kind of looks the same, except that they're even more heightened, to my eyes anyway, uh, from life by daubing their faces with this uh, white um, makeup that they all wear, which is, apparently keeps your face cool, but also clean. You'll notice from the map I posted there that uh, I'm doing this two kilometer, four kilometer round trip journey every day by foot. So it's uh, a series of walkscapes that I'm seeing. And um, actually, so Fujimoto in another part of that lecture talks about um, being influenced by Richard Long. And um, another German friend um, whose themes this starts to remind me of is my, my friend Jan Lindenberg, who, who I'll actually be living with or very close to um, when I get back to Berlin in July. And he has been into, for quite a long time, this um, theorist called Lucius Burkhardt. I wrote a piece for Click Opera a few years ago called Walkscapes, Strollology and the Politics of Promenade, which mentioned Burkhardt. Um, and also Richard Long, uh, the opening paragraph said, what do these things have in common about a VHS tape of a 1988 documentary about the artist Richard Long entitled Stones and Flies, Richard Long in the Sahara, a double DVD of Andrew Cotting's film, um, Gallivant, the fictional documentary Robinson in Space by Patrick Keeler, and the book um, Walkscapes, Walking as an Aesthetic Practice by Francesco Carreri. Uh, and uh, so then I go on to explain that what they have in common is something to do with the aesthetics of walking, particularly how walking gives you a certain perspective on landscape, kind of alienation from alienation. Walking might be an adventure, an exploration, a way of making art and architecture, 
an intervention, a way to approach urban planning, a situation, even a sort of politics. So when I first arrived in Yangon, I took the taxi in from the airport, um, and then I've taken taxis occasionally to some of the attractions, like the zoo, which are a bit further out, or the French Institute. But uh, mostly, um, and I took a bicycle taxi one day and got ripped off, so I never did that again. So mostly, I've, it's it's the kind of compact city centre where you can walk everywhere. And this means that um, you could imagine this exploded city, which Fujimoto was describing, exploded house across the city with different rooms in different areas, as long as they're all in a... F in, within walking distance of each other, or cycling distance if you have a bicycle, um, they're manageable. And uh, it also is a great way to stay physically active and to be at home with your body and keep your body healthy. So um, one of my rooms then is this Paris Borga Cafe. Another, um, actually, where I had lunch today, a place called uh, Cafe Virus, which um, sounds rather uninviting. And it's actually a very gloomy uh, but wonderful cafe in a, a covered market, which is pretty neglected, uh, pretty empty, and they have some bookstores there and some uh, clothes and fabric stores. Almost no customers. Uh, very busy on the ground floor, but then upstairs nobody really ventures in. And so I discovered this place rather belatedly called Cafe Virus, which uses the Virgin uh, typography, and uh, that has delicious food, very cheap. And um, so it all becomes part of this strollology, which is a blend of sociology and urbanism, an attempt to correct the way technological progress from trains, cars, GPS has alienated our perception of the landscapes we move through. Lucius Burkhart um, thought that strollology walking could be a serious science. Um, so this was all based at the University of Kassel, and it was called Spaziergang Wissenschaft. Spaziergang means uh, someone who wanders almost with a rucksack through the countryside. Uh, it's going into space, literally. And uh, I think that's what interests architects like uh, Fujimoto about, about this, that you can send buildings into space, you can sort of um, uh, distribute a building through, the, through a city. And I would love to rent rooms, uh, sm single rooms. I mean, it's slightly absurd when you, when you hear Fujimoto talking about having his bathroom you know, a couple of kilometers from his living room. But it is possible in an Asian city where life is very safe and um, also in a warm climate where you are never battered by the elements. I, I think it would be a very different um, uh, proposition to come here in the rainy season when apparently it's just raining heavily and solidly for two or three months. It's really uh, amazing to look on Street View and see uh, pictures of these streets taken when there are actually clouds in the sky because here in the early part of the year the sky is blue it's clear every single day it hasn't rained once in the six weeks i've been here and um it's extremely hot today it was like 36 degrees centigrade and it does give you this uh, um the possibility the safety and the friendliness because the people here are very friendly gives you the possibility to really spread out in this really ideal way your existence in the three to four hours you might be outside your main living space to go and sort of colonize um, communal spaces or not colonize that's that's too colonial uh, share spaces with other people watch the world go by so as I've said before it does have this flaneur kind of element to it which, which makes it really one of the best cities I've I've ever been to um, because it is so pleasant to observe this flamboyance and also to be a flaneur and to be amongst other flaneurs because people are not apparently not having to work too hard they're not making much money here but um, they are taking life easy and with pleasure Yangon is laid out like uh, like New York in the sense that it's got um, numbered streets uh, it's got these main avenues like New York sort of tilted on its side because it's got these main avenues which are called Mahabandula which is uh, the street I mostly walk on. Um, Strand Road is the street down at the docks. These are all the east-west uh, main arteries. Strand Road is, has a slightly heavier atmosphere. Um, one might be mocked by subcontinentals uh, down there, or high-fived, in fact. There's a kind of different sense of personal space as you go through the different racial areas. So um, a lot of um, people who look to me like Bengalis uh, working in um, 
selling rope and um, plastic buckets and electrical goods down on Strand Road. And then Merchant Road sort of branches off from Strand Road and becomes a southerly parallel to Maha Bandula. And um, these main arteries uh, east-west are crisscrossed by streets called 26th Street, 24th Street, 23rd Street, but those are interrupted by streets with names. So um, the uh, street my hotel is on has, has a name. It's called uh, Shin Odan Street, which sounds like Irish or something. Sin Odan Street it would be um, 18th Street, but in fact the next street is called 18th Street. So there are the numbers sort of just skip around the named streets. And um, the main book street is 37th Street. That's one of my main destinations when I'm out walking. And you would think counting the numbers uh, from my street to that, it would be about um, 17 uh, blocks. But in fact, it's closer to 30 blocks because these um, because of the intervention of these named streets. The kitchen is every single bloody street in this city because you have street food everywhere, especially in Chinatown. The streets are... The pavements are almost impassable because of the number of vendors of, um, you know, unlicensed, completely um, illegal or extra-legal um, vendors of just whatever they want to sell. People selling fruits, people selling um, buns with meat inside, uh, people selling... I haven't seen insects yet, as you see in Thailand, but um, certainly... Um, Pretty much anything you could imagine is sold on the street, and I've had to be very careful with it because my stomach has been upset. It's already a high risk for me, even in Japan, where the food hygiene standards are extremely high. In hot weather, where I'm drinking a lot of ice drinks and coffee, I get an upset stomach very easily. So um, it's been almost impossible for me, unfortunately, to eat the, uh, the stuff you see on the street. Uh, some of it you just wouldn't even go near. Some of the meat stuff that's fly-blown and uh, looks putrid and uh, decaying I just wouldn't I couldn't imagine anyone having the stomach for that but uh, they must have stomachs of iron it's worth mentioning a few of the downsides of the city since I've been singing its praises so much and the downside is that the whole city is not just a kitchen but a spittoon because people are chewing betel and spitting it uh, and I have seen people accidentally spitting on directly onto other people and then apologizing profusely for it the other annoying thing is uh, well, the curbs are very high, that's a bit of a... And, and the infrastructure is very crumbly, so if you're a very old, infirm person, or a person in a wheelchair, for instance, forget it, there is really no way you could survive. Um, also, the taxis are aggressive in the sense that they toot their horns to tout for trade, and so you basically have these taxis honking at you wherever you go, especially if you're a foreigner. They sort of racially profile you and uh, foreigners pay more I guess so they they want those as passengers um, the buses also have incredibly loud horns I'd heard that horns were not allowed to be blown in the within the city limits of Yangon but uh, that's obviously not enforced as a regulation um, that's really the only downsides uh, and also I mentioned that, that people were um, a bit like the stall keepers are all a bit like sort of art students in the west failed art, art students who might end up uh, manning a stall at Portobello Market or Camden Market or something in London. Uh, so it's kind of, it's almost as if this is a, a place where you recognize a lot of talent and a lot of glamour. People have amazing hairstyles. The classic man's hairstyle is to have sort of quite short shaved uh, style at the back and then sort of a parting that, that is a, in a sort of horseshoe shape and then a kind of a ponytail which sticks up in the air. And often there'll be very bright colors orange or yellow dye uh, in the top part, but the bottom part will be kept black. It's kind of um, pop star thing going on. And people have amazing torsos, amazing body definition, muscular definition, because they're carrying stuff and using their bodies all day. Uh, that's tremendously important. And, and for some reason, Justin Bieber is, is, is big here. And I mean, tattoos and things. You get a certain sort of Justin Bieber feel off the, the, the males. Um, it's also a very young population profiles so what we take for granted in a lot of western places is seeing a lot of old people everywhere and um, the sort of tone of the streets being a sort of grey tone as a result and a rather lethargic 
under-energized tone, and that's really the opposite here. Although the weather is very hot and people do move slowly and take life easy here, there is, especially in Chinatown, there's a, a very strong youthful energy of people really bustling around carrying huge objects on their heads like ants, you know, things many times their own body size, and staying incredibly fit and doing it with this slightly macho glamour, uh, you know, the competency glamour. Of uh, of people who know they look good and they're c continually re-knotting their longies, um, in in this kind of, kind of slightly macho way. And uh, I'm not, I, I, you know, I've been thinking recently about machismo and um, chivalry as being two sides of the same coin in a sense. They're both uh, etiquettes which people use to deal with strangers. And I guess rap and hip hop, in a way, have uh, the Black American etiquette. Uh, has been very influential in the West as a kind of vigilant, mistrustful uh, manner of relating to strangers, that you wear your hooded top with the hood up and you, you look hard, you look like, hey, don't mess with me, I might have a gun, you know, I might be uh, fatal to you. Um, that's, in a way, the negative uh, mirror image of the sort of more medieval courtly aesthetic of chivalry where you're continually delighted to meet someone, um, delighted to try to assist them in any way you can. That has kind of, in, in modern times, that's turned into a sort of customer service ethic, ethic or etiquette, which uh, is at its most exemplary in Japan, where there's a, an absolutely courtly, exquisite chivalry in terms of being welcomed into shops and treated as a potential customer or an actual customer with exquisite manners. But um, in a way... You know, those are two sides of the same coin. And here, here it's um, there is kind of both. There isn't really that sort of um, slavish uh, Japanese-style shop behavior. But people are just genuinely, they seem genuinely friendly and uh, approachable and keen to ask where you're from, ask questions like that. Um, so, But I guess what I'm really saying is that the, um, the sort of hip-hop... Uh, menace ma machismo etiquette is not so notable here it's not so present although you do have a glamour i think you do have this so so for me that's why it keeps reminding me of the new romantic time rather than the hip-hop time that we're sort of living in it's not see we live in a, a particularly aggressive um era i think when people are and the aggression comes out of anxiety and fear of the other and also from multiculturalism which is uh which is failing in, in a lot of people's eyes, a failed multiculturalism where people are not all getting rubbing along together. Um, this is a city which refutes that very strongly because people from many different religions and ethnicities are getting along, in the city anyway, very well together. Uh, and the etiquette, it's neither hip-hop uh, misanthropy nor a, um, a kind of chivalric um, uh, philanthropy. It's kind of something else which is, I guess, simple friendliness. So what could be a better welcome to a walker? Open University.